Place names are important and tell us a lot of valuable information about that place's history and geography. Yet many names also come to us with centuries of use attached and they become distorted over time as people misspell or mishear them. And in some cases, folklore then becomes attached to explain their origins. As an example, you can find no place near Stanley. Some believed it was originally given its name as part of a tax evasion scam. The locals could tell tax collectors that they were from no place and not actually be lying. Sadly, the truth is actually more prosaic. Most historians think it's just an adaptation of North Place. So in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore, we're going to have a look at some unusual English place names. What folklore is attached to them, if any? Let's find out. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. Welcome to June. I hope that your month has been off to a flying start. Um, Mine's been basically as quiet as you'd expect because I have been off work for half term so I've been doing lots and lots of research for the podcast so there's quite a lot of exciting stuff coming but I'll get to that at the end of the episode so we can just dive into the actual content for now. As you might have gathered by the intro we are looking at strange place names and I did want to give a little bit of a caveat before I get started because when I first mentioned I was going to do this on Twitter Quite a lot of people gave suggestions of places, there were some really good suggestions, some of them are in this episode, some of them I haven't been able to look at because there just isn't any folklore that I can find attached to them, so they're just a weird name, and other ones weren't so much strange place names as just slightly rude ones, so they sound like something else, and I've decided not to cover those ones because A, most of the origins are actually really, really boring, and also B, because I do know that I have some younger listeners to the podcast, I thought I wanted to kind of try and keep it family friendly. So we're not going to be looking at anything like super rude, although there is one in there which is also hilarious. So you'll see which one I mean when we get to it. But the reason why we're doing place names, really, I mean, I find place names absolutely fascinating. And I think my interest in place names really started with Newcastle, as you might imagine. Because I did a little walk around town from one of the guidebooks that we've got. There's thousands of them, but I was walking to a round Newcastle guidebook. And it explained that Amen Corner, next to St Nicholas's Cathedral, or Newcastle Cathedral as it's now called, was so named because the monks or priests or whoever was at the church, I can't remember now, would walk around the church saying their prayers. And when they got to Amen Corner, that's where they would say Amen, hence the name. And I know that there's obviously lots of Amen Corners around the world, so it would be quite interesting to know if they also have the same reason behind their name. But anyway, so that was what really prompted my interest in place names in general, but particularly street names. And in this particular episode, we are sticking with place names, but I am putting one street name in just because it's an absolute doozy. So if you would like street names, please do let me know. There are some absolute corkers, particularly in London. But as I say, if you would like that as a, an episode, please let me know and I can always put that in at a later date. But anyway, why place names? What's in a name? Well, clues abound that can basically suggest the presence of archaeological sites in the area. We can find out about historical events via place names. And Charles Wynne Hammond actually gives the example of the Scandinavian place names that help us to plot the Viking invasion across Britain. And then place names can also tell us a lot about geographical features that now may be lost. And bearing in mind as well, of course, obviously lots of the place names I've, I've looked at essentially for Britain and England in particular have then been taken to other parts of the world as well when people have then settled. So it's quite interesting, even if you're not in the UK, that you may go, oh my God, I know somewhere called that. So hopefully that'll be cool for you as well. But the point that we've got to remember is that in past times, places didn't always have fancy names because the river or the hill would have been fine when people lived in smaller communities because people would know which hill or river you meant. Once people started travelling further afield, of course, they would need new names to differentiate between features and settlements. And according to Wynne Hammond, originally these names either applied to geographical features or human structures like farms and forts. And after a while, the names basically started to apply to each other. It all got a little bit mixed up. 
and these place names were then adapted or replaced by the Romans, then the Anglo-Saxons, then the Vikings, and finally the Normans. Because let's be honest, there was quite a lot of invasion going on before 1066. So all of these names have then become like a bit of a mishmash of all these different languages that have then been brought to the country, which I think is cool. But anyway, as an example, the influence becomes clear when we look at the area of Bear Park in Durham, and that's spelled all one word. Now, there's never been a specific bear reservation in the area, although that would be cool, but it's not actually the original name because in Norman French, it was called Beau Repair, which means beautiful retreat. And like typical northerners, we heard Beau Repair and turned it into Bear Park. So this is basically how you can see how easily place names can and do change. Now, there are problems when it comes to decoding place names, as we shall see, because folklore then becomes attached to them and people repeat the imaginative name origins rather than the often more prosaic fact. And that is fine, but it's just sometimes it's quite useful to know both of the reasons. So Wayne Hammond gives the example of Purfleet in Essex, and in one legend, Queen Elizabeth I travelled to the Thames estuary because she wanted to inspect her fleet following its victory over the Spanish Armada. And in one apocryphal tale, she remarked, Alas, my poor fleet, which then became the town of Purfleet. So in this post, we're going to explore the folklore that's attached to these unusual place names, but then also just in some cases, their origins, because even their origins are quite cool. A couple of these aren't necessarily that strange, but there were requests, and I do just want to say up front, a couple of people asked if I could cover the location of Wide Open in Newcastle, and I literally couldn't find anything about where the name came from, so don't expect to hear about Wide Open. But anyway, let's crack on with the place names. So we're going to start with Ferry Hill because I'm doing them in alphabetical order. And Ferry Hill's in County Durham. And you might think it's not that weird or unusual a place name. Now, the reason I've included it is because A, this was one of the requests. But B, the name actually makes no sense when you discover that it lies nowhere near water. So why Ferry? Well, there is one theory that the name comes from Fagan, an old English word meaning wooded hill. And a dictionary of British place names backs this one up, saying Fergan means wooded hill and hill is just hill. So calling it Fergan Hill basically meant it was called Wooded Hill Hill. There we go. According to Caroline Taggart, it was also called Ferrigan in the 10th century and Ferry on the Hill in the 14th century. There's another theory that Sir Roger de Ferry killed the last wild boar in the area in 1200 AD and there's a plaque to commemorate that particular event. And then obviously his name went on to give the hill Ferry Hill. And other people think that the village name came from a river that flowed through a nearby limestone gap and that river was known as a ferry. Now the main railway line now runs through that gap. So having a village on a hill near this ferry would give rise to the name Ferry Hill. So it's not particularly unusual except for where it actually is. The next one is also County Durham and this one, it was really disappointing and it's called High Hand and Hold and I've been fascinated by this place name for years because it's near Beamish in County Durham and any listeners in the North East will know how often when you were at school you went on trips to Beamish. Fantastic open air museum but still. So I thought, oh, I'll do high hand and hold. And basically, the hand and hold part of the name derives from hand and howl. And that's actually a nearby veil. And the howl part refers to the hollow. And likewise, den in place names often refers to a dean or valley. So this would basically seem like quite a likely origin that it's essentially just taking its name from a nearby location. And high generally just means that it's above the thing. So we're going to move from that slight disappointment to the Isle of Dogs, which again has always fascinated me. And this one is in London. And according to a dictionary of British place names, the name was first recorded in 1520. And A.D. Mill says it was probably a descriptive term about the Marshy Peninsula, which may have housed wild or stray dogs. So it was quite literally the island where the dogs lived. Now, when Hammond actually relates the more commonly held folklore, which is that Charles II exercised his spaniels here when he stayed at Greenwich Palace. And this apparently gave the place its name. Though many people do think this is just purely folklore because there's not actually really any record of any royal kennels having been kept on the Isle of Dogs. Wynne Hammond also notes that the name is older than Charles II's reign, so again, it's unlikely to have come from that. And it's also possible the name is actually a corruption of Isle of Ducks because it was also a once a popular site for wildfowl. So that somehow makes it a little bit cooler. 
Now this next one is super short and that's no man's land, spell all one word. There is actually a no man's land in both Devon and Wiltshire and a dictionary of British place names says this actually just means land no one owns, often on a boundary. So this basically speaks to some kind of, I think, boundary dispute at the time. We're going to move on to once brewed and twice brewed and the reason why these are put together is because if you come in from the east, it's called once brewed. If you come in from the west, it's called twice brewed. And the little settlement itself actually sits near Hadrian's Wall and the Vindolanda Roman Fort. So where on earth did a village get a, such a weird dual name as this? Well, the original name or the older name really is twice brewed. And that's because the village inn is called twice brewed inn. And one theory for why it's called that, because let's be honest, that's a bit of an unusual name itself, goes back to 1464 and the Battle of Hexham. And the night before the battle, soldiers fighting for the York cause decided that the beer wasn't strong enough. So they demanded it be brewed again, hence twice brewed. The following day, they actually rebuffed an early morning raid by the Lacastrian army, which fled. So because of this victory, people think that the inn took its name from the fact that they had the beer brewed twice. Another theory actually posits that in the 18th century, farmers served weak ale. So the inn was essentially just advertising its stronger ale through its name. And again, I've said before how Northerners are really, really literal about quite a lot of things. So if you're like, how shall we advertise our beer? We'll say it's twice brewed. That will be how the conversation would essentially go. But then why once brewed? Well, this theory apparently runs that the teetotaler Lady Trevelyan had opened a youth hostel nearby in 1934. And she announced that they would serve nothing stronger than tea once brewed. And the name stuck, which gave the spot its dual name. And the youth hostel is now a visitor centre. So we're going to move on from there to Pennycombe Quick, which is literally spelled all one word, which is in Plymouth in Devon. And the most common theory for this particular place name is that it's actually named for the Penny Pub. Other people think it might come from the term Pen E Come Quick, meaning head of the creek. There is another version in which a woman lived in the area and she would give visitors the boiling water that they needed to make their tea for a penny per person. And the woman would then tell these visitors how she made money fast or made the penny come quick with this simple business idea and then over time the name stuck. Others have actually claimed that there was a toll house on the road from Plymouth to Saltash and as it was very busy, locals said the pennies came quick. Now, a dictionary of British place names does seem to favour this type of origin, saying originally perhaps a nickname for a prosperous farm or productive piece of ground. And I think you'd probably agree that anywhere that had a toll house was probably going to be quite a productive piece of ground. But this version of the story can't really be right because the name actually predates the toll house and was in use by the mid 17th century. Because in 1643, it was actually listed as Penny Come Quick, albeit Penny spelled P-E-N-I. So the original Cornish name of Pen E Cum Gwick, meaning Head of the Creek, is far more likely. We're going to move on to one of my favourite place names literally ever, and that's Pity Me. And it's literally spelled the words Pity and Me. Now, various theories abound as to where this particular name came from. And a dictionary of British place names says, and I quote, It's a whimsical name bestowed in the 19th century on a place considered desolate, exposed or difficult to cultivate, end quote. And Caroline Taggart agrees with this one, saying it's more likely, quote, the name was deliberately chosen to be spoken with a heavy sigh by the person who had to work this unproductive land, end quote. Now, there are other theories, like I say, and some people think it actually draws on the term mere, spelled M-E-R-E, to mean a shallow lake. And in this theory, it could actually be a version of petit mere, meaning a small shallow lake, obviously petit as in the French word for small. Or it could be petit mere, referring to a muddy mere. Other people think that it's actually pithead mere because minehead pumps may have discharged their wastewater here. Now, there are actually other villages in Northumberland with the same name, so that some people think it might refer to land use or a feature of the landscape. Bearing in mind, obviously, County Durham and Northumberland are separate. But the Pity Me in North Tyndale is believed to have gotten its name from Bed and Maze, which is an ancient British name meaning burial ground, although no one's actually applied this to the more famous Durham version. Other people think that St Cuthbert's coffin was dropped here on the way to Durham and Pity Me came from the saint's admonishment to the monks. And in 1934, a letter appeared in the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Intelligencer to explain the origin of the village name. And in their theory, and I quote, the usually accepted version is that it was an offshoot of Finkel Priory some six miles away, which was reputed to have been destroyed by Cromwell's army. It was what we would now describe as a first aid station, hence the name Petit Mias, 
afterwards corrupted to pity me, end quote. As you can see, there are different versions for that one. And most people seem to come back to the Pithead Mere one or the Difficult or Exposed Land. But either way, I just think it's a really cool name. And speaking of a really cool name, this one actually comes with an exclamation mark and that's Westwood Hall and it is literally spelt with an exclamation mark at the end and that's in Devon. And a dictionary of British place names explains that it's actually a modern name because it was actually named after the novel of the same name by Charles Kingsley in 1855. And the novel was set in the area and it was the, the town was essentially named that to help cash in on the tourism associated with the book. Now we are going to go on to what I did say was kind of the closest we're going to get to a rude name and that's Wet Wang in East Yorkshire and you can probably guess what its name is often translated to mean but the thing that I quite liked about this name is the fact that when you look at its historical origins it also kind of gives you a really interesting insight into the Viking use of England if that makes sense. So in the Doomsday Book, it's actually listed as Wet Wanger, and that's spelled W-E-T-U-U-A-N-G-H-A. And some people think that this comes from the Old Norse name Vertvanger, which is believed to mean meeting place, place of justice, or field of summons for the trial of an action. We can break the name down because Wang comes from Vanger or field, and the wet more than likely comes from the Old English word wet, meaning wet, as you'd imagine. So it basically translates also to wet field. And some people think that this is also a wet field in comparison with the nearby dry field or dry field, but this would be unusual because wet wang is actually considered a dry place in and of itself. Now, a dictionary of British place names chooses field for the trial of illegal action for the meaning, and it's quite cool because when you look at the way that trials and so on were run in other areas, different fields were used each time for the trial to take place, but it sounds like here they used the same location every time, which is obviously what we would recognise as a way of running a court system now. So I thought that was quite interesting that the name came from a very specific, almost form of like Norse bureaucracy, essentially, and then it's gone on to become a place name. And while it also has nothing to do with the place name, Wet Wang also has another claim to fame because it was the site of an Iron Age chariot burial believed to be for a female warrior. So I thought that was quite cool. Now, the final place name that we're going to go for is actually a street name. And as I say, if you do want a separate episode on street names, just let me know. But this is Whitmer Watmergate in York. And no one really knows where it actually gets its name because it's also one of the shortest streets in York. Some people think its original name was Whitnua Watnua Gate, which actually translates as what a street, which would be a fantastic name. And others think that York's whipping post actually stood here in the Middle Ages, which kind of sounds a little bit too obvious, if you ask me. Other people think it basically means not one thing nor another. And if that's true, that makes it the most liminal place in York. Because remember, liminal places are anywhere that's neither one thing nor another. And because this street connects to other streets, it is a bit of a between place of sorts. And wherever the name actually came from, the gate part of the name comes from the Norse word for street, which is garter, not an actual gate. Now, as you can see from this small collection, and like I say, there are so many others that I could have included, but I just thought these ones were quite interesting for the names in the folklore that had become accrued to them. A lot of place names can accrue cool legends to explain their names, but the truth is often far more prosaic, and it's what we can learn about what the geography used to look like or indeed what the space was used for by previous generations is what I think makes place names so interesting. Please do let me know if you'd like me to do a street names one as well. Now that is the end of this week's episode. I do want to quickly give you a heads up on what's coming. Obviously next week we are going to be looking at time-based folklore although to be fair it's mostly stuff around like clocks and calendars and things but we're going to be doing kind of the folklore of time next week. We're also going to be having a look at British Big Cats because that was another request and I thought that fitted in with our strange miscellany theme which is what we're doing this month and like I say I do have one slot left so if you do have any requests for topics feel free to use the requests form in the link below in the show notes. And the other thing as well also if you are wondering about becoming a Patreon supporter because obviously that does help me keep the podcast going. The exclusive episode for last month was the land-based folklore stuff and then off the back of that we're going to be having a look at prophets and seers and so on and prophecies and so on for the June bonus episode and you can get that by becoming a supporter at like the 350 a month or more tier. And we're also going to be doing an illustrated talk 
this month as well for the five pound a month or more tier and for that one we're going to be looking at victorian morning etiquette so that's going to be quite interesting if becoming a supporter is a little bit beyond your means that's absolutely fine you can still support the podcast by telling a friend or leaving a review or anything like that or just simply tweeting me to let me know how much you enjoy it also helps as well but that is it from me for this week i hope that you have a marvelous week ahead and i will see you soon cheerio well thank you for listening and thanks for visiting fabulous folklore i hope you enjoyed your stay if you did why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice if you enjoy the show why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.